Hello, it's September 8, 2017. This is Tony Schmario coming to you from my father, brosal.org YouTube channel. And uh, first, of course, we were, we're all waiting for the biggest hurricane in history. And I want to do a show about that. And I'm going to do it right after this one. So please uh, pay attention to that one because my heart has been going out to all the people that I know are have already been involved and are going to be involved. Uh, but I've been also studying, uh, listening actually to our own Bible study from a couple of years ago on the Gospel of John, inspired by our listener Michael, who's been going over that himself from what, uh, what he said. And, um, and so I started listening to it again. And, and of course, <laughs> I thought there was a rapture. This was, I think, June in 2015. So it shows you how things change. Other than that, I think it's a very full look at the Gospel of John, though, listening to it. I think we'll revisit it again some, sometime soon in our Bible study because uh, there's even more, I think, to, you know, good inspiration to mine out of the words recorded there that we've lost in the modern translation. And I mean the modern expression of Christianity, and that's why uh, I've been on the kick I mean, this whole Bible study to me really should be called false Christianity, you know, exposing false Christianity, because that's what I got brainwashed into. I'm like one of those uh, Tom Cruise is in Dad, that crazy Scientology. I'm like one of those Scientologists that was just, you know, they got me as a teenager. I was committed. I thought we were saving the world and we're the only ones doing it. And so we're justified and everybody else is in trouble and then you realize what a hoax it all is and an absolute trick and full of people that have nothing but self-interest at heart playing on the people that don't so that while you still do have that innocent initiative they take as much advantage of it as possible and make you the face of everything they're doing and then uh, you know either you burn out or you remain duped but they never they never seem to have their heart in the right place so you know, that's so I had to start studying the scripture to find out what's going on with Christianity. And, and now it's been a couple of years where I'm really sure about a lot of things. One of them, there's no rapture. That's silly. That's a silly way to look at the first resurrection uh, for Michael, who might be st still going through that study. My argument about the Philadelphian church is one of the inspirations for this talk because Christianity in the 21st century I argue can be presented in the way that Dr. Scott used to present the seven churches that are in Asia really outline the history or a history a representation of a history of what the followers of this story have gone through from the first love of Ephesus through the persecution, Smyrna, I think it was, the height of Pergamos, the, you know, the Roman Catholic beginning, I believe, um, Thyatira, for, I, I forget all the names and the associations at the moment because the last two have always been the ones that seem to sum up our reality with Philadelphia and Laodicea. Philadelphia being the one of brotherly love that's told, hold on, no one takes your crown, I'm holding a door open for you. Laodicea, you think you're rich and have need of nothing, but I say you're poor and wretched and miserable and you don't even know it and you should buy gold from me. And they both have a door. <laughs> and behold, I stand at the door and knock. Philadelphia, behold, I hold open a door and no one can shut it. We always have traditionally bought the, you know, Dr. Scott and the rapture line of teaching and interpretation that 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 was an indication of holding a door open like when the revelation opens behold i saw a door open in heaven john says and immediately i was in the spirit so there's certainly i mean i followed it for years i was teaching it two years ago so don't think i'm not aware that claiming there's no rapture sounds as absurd as claiming there's no hell for all non-believers it's just that if you want to be a serious student of scripture you, you know you go show me I've done a lot of study now. I had a lot of contextual background in my mind. 
of where my, you know, the indications come from for my story, why I think what I do. I've read a lot of it now and fleshed out all my ideas, so I'd sure love to see a better presentation, a more, a more convincing for me. Anybody could be convinced of anything, but I would like to see what would convince me. And so far, I say that I misunderstood, like all people, that Philadelphia, the door that's being held open, of course, is that one for that small group of outcalled ones, the ones that actually follow him. That's the crown that started all the way from the first love. That's why these churches outlined in Revelation, I would argue, my conclusion is for myself, that they not only represent the idea of a historical narrative, but that at any one time in history, they represent the characteristics of belief, of following Jesus. You've always got the ones that are waking up to it, seeing it for the first time and have that first love and they're ready to cut family ties, go, you know, go to the ends of the earth, become a missionary, give up everything, right? And it's kind of, it seems to have that effect or it used to, at least it did in the beginning. And so I think there's always that church of Ephesus and Jesus cautions that church, hang on to that first love. It's not just the people that lived in the first century. If you have that first love today and you're living in that, Jesus says, hang on to that first love. Because Pergamos, remember the height you've fallen from. You, you go from being someone ready to die for it to someone begging for your life over it, right? Is, is what I see in that way. At one point, you're so brave. You give up everything. You follow him. You laugh in the face of persecution and even as much as one possibly can, you know, having your life taken from you or whatever. Uh, and, and that grows to a point where everyone's scared for their life, bowing to authority, oh, wouldn't step out of line. They'll let you talk, talk, talk until they come and say, okay, you say one more word, we, you know what I mean? We'll spray you with mace in the face, take you to jail, fine you, take away all your privileges. And then let you out and say, go ahead, keep talking about Jesus. Well, now, now we'll know, you know, for any of us. You say, nobody ever looks to me. I, I only know what Christianity says. I know what the scripture says. I know what modern Christianity seems to represent to me because I grew up in it. It's all false lies, hypocrisy, judgment, condemnation, self-righteousness, backstabbing, bleh, just what everybody sees. It's hard to hide that kind of falsity from a human spirit. That's why I'm always pointing out, you know, none of my friends are Christians. In the, I mean, not really, but they're, they're Christians in the sense that they're, they're people that give themselves for others. There's no doubt in my mind when he separates the sheep and the goats. And he says, but Lord, we, you know, when did we ever do anything for you? You say, you know, whatever you did for the least of my brethren, you did for me. So I know all my friends are, you know, they, I don't have to bash them over the head to believe in Jesus. You know, I don't think that's what Jesus asked. He said, follow him, which is to represent him in the world. And that's why so few do it. And, and so I want to get back to this rapture thing. I, I think that the reason that's pushed so hard, that Christianity in the 21st century, they're pushing rapture. They're pushing the end. They're pushing this judgment. They're pushing everybody that doesn't believe. They're taking all the scripture out of context and making people like me look like the, you know, the, the prophets that will come with to give the people what they want to hear and itchy ears and all that kind of thing. Yeah, but I'm not, you know, I'm not saying the easy thing. <laughs> you know, Joel Olstein might be accused of someone that comes along telling people what they want to hear. I could hardly be accused of that. I'm, I'm accusing myself and everybody else of not living up to, up to the bargain. You want eternal life? You say, do you believe in Jesus? I say, I believe in Jesus. <laughs> Boy, that's a tall order. If you want to talk about these seven churches, if you want to talk about first resurrection, that we we went over in Revelation when Dad and I a couple of years ago were studying this together. How it quite clearly says those that give their head will take part in this first resurrection. 
there's that other part in Revelation that says, and uh, tells the tells them, hang on a little longer till till your brethren, you know, that are going to give their heads for this till we get right. The the martyrs are saying, Lord, Lord, how much longer? Come on, we see how. And I doubt that it's like, oh, come on, you promised. You know, I mean, I don't see the scripture representing some. You know, people look at God so anthropomorphically, like it's a mis people are waiting on God and God's sort of taken too long and no these are the people who have a righteous cause that's always before God when you read the scripture the martyrs and the people that get you know the good the good deeds that are done that are written in the books that nobody sees right that's that's always before God see so we have confidence in that but I imagine that at this stage of the game he's saying calm down just give it a little longer like, yeah, you see that we're here. You know what I promised. Like, like the way Daniel was saying, okay, God, you told Jeremiah 70 years. So, come on now. So I see it's kind of a reflection like that. You know, and Daniel saw how close the 70 years. I mean, are you going to keep your word literally 70 years? Here we go. You know, and so here we are now. And, and that's why I'm trying to point out that in this 21st century what people should see is that literal thing is that this you know the first resurrections for these martyrs and the people who, like the apostles and you know the ones that gave everything that saw what you know that believed in him and followed him see because i find that when you look at the last sort of speech of jesus to it, you know that's recorded i think it's in john probably they all have some part of it or a couple of them do but I believe this one might be in John where he prays for them. And it's just before they take him away. And it's after he washes their feet. When after they've argued, who's going to be the greatest? And, you know, and he says, the greatest would be your servant. And he washes their feet and says, now, you know, I'm the master. You're the servant. You see how I treated you? That's what I want you to do for each other. He didn't say do that for the world. He said, that's how you should be with each other. Not like these pastors trying to one-up each other I remember 30 years almost ago 20 anyway when dad was trying to enlighten the sort of the mod I mean, like when world news daily first started and all that you know my father was trying to enlighten those people as to the fact that they should be looking at the middle east not at rome that they should be paying attention to daniel as the sign and you know how how much the eschatology was lacking at that time the vision and you know all they cared about is their story their next book their next you know sensational thing that's moving them to the higher dollar advertising platform right you know but isn't that exactly what is supposed to be forsaken for the truth isn't that the suffering that you know you could <laughs> you know you could I mean, that's what I see. I mean, that must have been the way the disciples felt. Damn, Jesus, you got all this power and you're just going to gonna keep healing people and walking on water, but you're not going to smack those Romans around a little bit? You're not going to set us up in our temple with all that power? So when you look at the reflection of it all, the, the presentation of this you know, rapture, what Paul really uses the word forsaking that he's accused of. They accuse Paul of teaching people to forsake. The, now that there's G, remember, Paul comes wrong like a dozen years after Jesus dies. Paul's originally a Pharisee who's persecuting this movement. These, they're not called Christians. They're these Messianic Jews at that point that are saying the Messiah has arrived. They're, they're followers of John originally, John the Baptist, that said this guy was the Messiah. How else did you relate them? What sect of people are these in the days when, when uh, Saul, before his name is changed to Paul, when he's chasing them as a Pharisee, you know, what are they known as? Who are they? You know, they're following this John the Baptist who claimed this guy was the Messiah and started this sect of people that say he raised from the dead. And all of that is just so blasphemous to Paul, to Saul at the time. And so by the time Paul comes along and his vision is that, okay, this thing is like what Hebrews points out. 
this sacrifice is good for all mankind, it's good for all creation, it fixes everything. Well, that wasn't what the Jews were originally going around talking about for, you know, quite a long time. Even after Peter said the Romans can be saved too, it's still the whole argument when Paul comes around looking at his flesh to see is he circumcised and accusing him. All these years later, he's teaching people to forsake the law of Moses, apostasia, right? Not catch away. Hmm? No way to misinterpret that, right? No way to say that it means falling away in the way of catching away. Because, you know, Paul uses the word harpazo to describe his own. I know a man 14 years ago that was harpazo to the third heaven. Whether in the body or out of the body, I don't know. But uh, he was harpazo and saw things and heard things, right? So he uses that word, which does mean snatch, like snatch out of the way of an oncoming train. Harpazo. You know, it doesn't just mean go to heaven. To snatch something out of the way. I harpazoed the child out of the way of the moving car. That's what that means. So Christians have taught that that's what apostasia means is what must happen before the man is in. But apostasia, Paul also used to describe, hey, they accused me of apost teaching everyone to apostasia, the law of Moses. How do you get catch away from that when the word means forsake? Right? So in the same vein, he says, you guys know that before this man of sin comes, a, a, a apostasy is going to come, a forsaking. The thing they're accusing me of teaching about the law of Moses, an apostasy has got to come from among you. Not a catching away from among you. Because who gets caught away is the thing I finally come down to. Which few, I believe in Jesus, like the people that brought me in, the most hypocritical, like backstabbing, self-righteous, judgmental, I mean, just like Pharisees to me, right? Teachers of the law. My uncle thought he was a prophet. He might still think he's a prophet. He's got words from the Lord to give to me. So I know what I'm talking about with people like this. And he's going in the rapture, he thinks. But my friends, they don't know Jesus. They only know people like him. Oh, 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 oh. not only are they not going in any rapture, but they'll be lucky to get through the great tribulation. And then they'll be raised and judged to go to hell. Thrown into the lake of fire for denying the only Son of God. Of course, like we went through a couple years ago with John, interesting how he says the dead will hear him. Interesting how many places it recounts him talking to the dead, saving the dead, taking the dead, that God will raise up the dead, and the dead will hear him. So, you know, it's, it's uncanny. I mean, the whole point of this, I don't want to go on too long today because the whole point of this was to, to get to the reality that Christianity in the 21st century is, is an absolute, you know, it's, it's like a yin-yang opposition. It's like a Hegelian dialectic. The white that was originally white has been turned into black so that it's called white. And what was originally white has been turned into black so it's lost. And... Uh, and so this modern Christianity can better be seen, or I say it, that this vision of re Revelation in the seven churches can much more clearly be seen as encompassing this, these possible relationships to the Spirit of God, and w specifically, because this is the letters to the churches, the outcalled ones, the Spirit of these Jesus. We read in that John's Gospel that He called out these ones to Him. Right? He said only the, when he gave the teaching about to eat the flesh and drink the blood or you can't see the eternal life. And many of his disciples went away and he said, you know, only the ones God's called to me. So God's called these ones out to follow this shepherd with this crazy story about eating flesh, drinking blood, being born again. And everyone, I believe that, I believe that, I believe that. Yeah, but his command is to follow. Right? That's how you show it. And don't worry, you believe it, you'll be saved. Like everybody who believes in the name of Jesus. But this whole first resurrection thing, uh, now, 
getting back to that whole story and that and where i left off with the prayer of jesus and his last prayer and the washing of the feet and he finishes that explanation to his folks you see what i've done for you even though i'm the master you do this to each other not to the world the world you go out and you tell them what you've seen and show them that love that was love your brethren paul comes along and says, even as you're loving do it more right that's what shows that spirit of god the world can't deny it when you go out and you just you love them when they hate you you love them when they beat you 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 love them i mean you give what you have to people that don't love you back see that's odd that's strange that demands attention and explanation as jesus said those who you know love those who love them even the even the worst people do that it's loving those that hate you and so that's what he asked them to do now and he prayed that the people that he would go out would believe their story not act like them that's why you know they got these tongues of fire they got the, they went out in this same bravery as he had to give their life to see beyond to do miracles i suppose he said, you'll do greater things than you've seen me do and i don't doubt that that goes all the way to today you just would never hear about that in today's world. You think you would, but you certainly would not hear about someone who was doing it in the real spirit of God. They'd probably be you know, absolutely dirt poor like Jesus. They'd be just some weird nobody who people thinks are a devil, like they thought of him then. But Christianity in the 21st century has become this Laodicean expression, lukewarm, right? And as I say, I think all of these characteristics are available because Jesus says, I wish you guys would do like I showed you. I wish you guys would treat each other this way. And I pray God gives you the strength to go out and take the suffering like I'm going to have to take, to, to, follow in, to follow me. And I pray that the people that hear you would believe you. And that by the people who believe you, their action would show to the world and they'd have to say, yeah, the Messiah had come. So the whole idea was that these guys who were so close to it could give their life to go out and do the preaching and the pre not everybody was supposed to be on that level but the people who believed it so that's why i'm trying to you know believers all these christian believers because remember i'm all about exposing false christianity and trying to plant the seeds of what you know true christianity really is because it isn't what anyone sees it isn't what's on tv it's it's got almost nothing to, it's almost the opposite of what's talked about as Christianity. They only use some of the terminology and the central figure and the central idea. Oh, you're raised from the dead. But they make that out to be discredited by what they do about it. If he raised from the dead and you think you're going to raise from the dead, why are you out threatening people? <laughs> I mean, that's what he's going to do if you don't believe he raised from the dead. Something nobody can believe, according to the scripture, unless God calls you to believe this crazy. You can't understand him. You can't believe him. You can't believe it's better to be a servant. Scrub the feet of your servant. Give everything to the poor and follow him. You can't believe that. I can't believe that. I can theorize it could be true that there's a world in which such a God exists and Maybe that is true. Maybe he was that. But boy, do I believe it? Why don't I do it? Yeah, that's the whole point. So I think that's what separates the Philadelphians. That's the crown he's saying, hold on to. That's the you know, people that really love their neighbor. They're really just, here, take what I have, neighbor. I mean, that's, I don't know. What is brotherly love? Brotherly love. You, 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 every, you know, brotherly love. Brotherly. Here, brother. What I have, you have. Isn't that brotherly love? So I say it's, you know, that's the spirit. He's holding that door of eternal life. You know, that's what he came offering. Those who follow me. And the thing he's standing at the door knocking are all these believers that aren't hot or cold. You, yeah, you spent your whole life. I believe in Jesus. I believe in Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for my car. Thank you, Jesus, for my Right? And I don't mean to mock the people who, who actually have a, a very sort of uh, shallow faith, you know, a blind faith, nothing wrong with that. 
I mean, the people that truly, because, I mean, if that faith leads you to love your neighbor, hey, I'm, you don't have to intellectualize it. As I've always said, those people don't even need to hear anything I'm saying. They're, they're not on the internet. They don't need the internet. They're, they're loving their neighbor. They know that that's all there is and they're doing it. And, and when they're doing it in Jesus' name, you know, who cares that they don't, I mean, like I say, they're only hurting people to sit, threaten. You're going to go to hell, neighbor, if you don't believe it. But see, if you're loving your neighbor, that's probably not what you're saying. You're probably saying, you know, I, I'm a, I don't know what's going to happen. I'll let the Lord work it out, right? I only know I can't judge. I don't know. I don't know what the Lord's going to do. So the people that live in that faith of just believing that he is God, God raised him from the dead. You know, good for you. I don't mean to put down true faith. It's just that Christianity in the 21st century are, is not true faith. It's a, if anything, it's lukewarm. It's people that I believe, I believe, I believe. And they convince themselves that they believe it. As I've always said, I believe Jesus. I mean, I believe the story. I believe God raised him from the dead. I, but do I follow him? No, not really. What makes me think I'm getting raptured or anything else, you know? What's that whole story? What these things I'm going to heaven and everybody else going to hell. Where'd you get that? That's not in there. <laughs> What's in there is we're all going to Hades for at least a thousand years if you make it to the to this tribulation point. After the thousand years were ended, the rest of the dead were raised. Huh. Who gets part in that first resurrection? Well, those who give their heads probably those in the Philadelphian church, those in, I think it's Smyrna when he told, don't worry, you hang on. I know you're being, you're dying for it. You're, you, you think you're poor, but I tell you, you're rich. And he tells the lay of the scene, you think you're rich. I tell you, you're poor. So if that doesn't sort of demonstrate the difference between the real spirit of Christ and the spirit, and what Christianity is in the 21st century. So why are you confu Why is anyone confusing the two? That's the part I don't get. And there's so much more to talk about now when you, when you get into that confusion with what it has got going is all the memes in the world. The end. Watch out the end. Jesus has got... Well, no, he said when you see the wars and rumors of wars and the earthquakes and the famines, don't be alarmed. The end is not yet. <laughs> right? So Christianity doesn't understand that. The Pope is the Antichrist and of all their, you know, they've called Obama the Antichrist, they called Bush the Antichrist, they call Trump the Antichrist, they call the King of Spain the Antichrist, they've called the Prince uh, William the Antichrist, right? None of them even qualify when you consider, you know, false deliverer of who? I mean, who's the, of the world? Who's, who's going to crown someone Messiah? Who, which religious people are waiting for a Messiah? So, I want to sum that all up because that's all part of this sort of Bible study and thing, but it, it points to the eschatology in which I say that they're out to destroy primarily all the people who are left believing in a God outside of themselves, which is why they're making that dividing line very strong. They're pushing everybody, right? Bringing out all the alternative information, bringing out all the things that push the buttons, like the you know, transvestites and gay marriage in America. Oh, Americans are so shallow. The Christianity has become so pathetically brainwashed because it has to be. They're the great army. You know, that's what that city states for. So Christianity so pathetically brainwashed in America that you just tell them, you know, uh, gay marriage and that's the signs of the end and the devil's coming. And all of a sudden the Christians are off talking about Luciferian agenda and Satanism and all things they don't understand at all. Because uh, you find me Luciferians or Satanists of any sort of teaching degree, of any repute, you know, anybody that's, uh, you've got uh, a reputation in their community. Who's waiting for Lucifer to show up and get a crown, put on his head, sit, sit on the throne in Jerusalem instead of Jesus? You know, who's, where do you find that story? See, so all the Christian memes are created. And I say, it, the bigger plan that it seems I'm one of the... I mean, I can't find anybody else talking about it. I'm just going to say I'm the only one. I'm the only one I know that's talking about the fact that that's all 
on purpose because the destruction is primarily or the the number one person at the top of the list that, that is to be destroyed to bring in the golden age are all the people that still want to believe in Jesus especially that's always been number one for a hundred years I mean for I'm sure in the spirit of Antichrist it's been for 2,000 years but in my understanding of history the last hundred years the genocides are most heavy among two groups of people primarily the Orthodox Christians and the indigenous nations right who were being wiped out from the hundred years before that really so I, I guess if it included the last 200 years of genocides on the planet they used the Christians as they always do to destroy the indigenous people by calling them heathens uh, and then so I say the Christian army Washington DC is is the army for the the rulers and the Christians are the little bees, the workers, why they have to be kept, you know, on that bread and circus. Fear and carrot reward system, Hegelian dialectic to follow, red team, blue team to choose, all that kind of stuff comes from the need to keep Americans essentially, you know, unthinking for themselves because they wouldn't go for most of what they have been positioned into the last century. But anyway, the Back to the discussion, it, I believe that Christianity in the 21st century is the tool to destroy itself. As Albert Pike was trying to strategize, if that's the case, I, I don't want to get off on, I don't want to let people off on the tangent. Well, he didn't really say that. There's no proof. Fine. Somebody said it. William Guy Carr said it in the 50s. Clayman, it was said in the 20s. Clayman, it came from the 90, 1890s or whatever. Fine. I'm just going with the fact that it's been very accurate. It does paint an accurate picture of today. It gives a reason that the last hundred years Christianity has been primarily targeted, that Islam has been divided into and, and funded into this rash, uh, this radical Islam that, you know, it certainly could have been funded to be something else. So when you see that England's hands were in it, America's hands have been in it, the importance of oil, you know, the development dollars, the military, development and all that that's gone into the Middle East for the last hundred years you don't see a plan of peace and reconciliation that's for sure so whether you want to pretend it's all organic or developed or not it sure plays into the supposed Pike uh, strategy but you've got so you've got all these people you know the Islamists they don't believe in Jesus but they're divided amongst themselves divide and conquer Sunnis ready to kill the Shias she is ready to kill the Sunnis then you got the radical element that's supposedly threatening the world, like the Cold War of Russia, all just, all just in the news, you guys. Where is it really threat? I mean, you know, what's, how many more babies die of vaccinations or even, I don't know, drunk driving or overdose of pharmaceutical drugs that are prescribed by doctors? How many people die in hospitals in America every year just from malpractice? You know, accidentally cutting off the wrong leg is probably about as popular as, you know, terrorism in America to justify this kind of change of the world, change of travel, change of every, our whole way of life because of terrorism. So if you can't see the same thing went on with the Cold War with our great enemy Russia, who's our partner, you know, that's the kind of perspective. So if that's working that way there, you know, what's Christianity today? Who's been funding that? Where does it come from? Why is it wrong about everything? How, how come I can't find a single Christian with everybody's so zealous for Jesus? They love Jesus. They love the scripture. The scripture is the inspired word of God. But I can't get them into a dad for, you know, for 20 years now. You can't get them into a conversation about whether they've misinterpreted their word of God and might be saying the wrong thing. Ho, 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 ho. To suggest that is heresy because they have all their little standard answers. They pretend that they've heard you. What do you mean non-believers aren't going to hell? Bam, 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 bam. Here you go. And they'll go quote you Paul. Paul didn't use the word hell, he used the word Hades. Oh, you're just trying to use semantics, is it? Well, no, 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 I'm, <laughs> right? But see if you can get them to finally take this conversation seriously. What if Paul didn't use the word hell? Would that change your consideration? 
No, it says it other places. God's been saying it since the beginning. If you don't believe in God. See, and they've got that Old Testament God concept on their mind. And that's why what's come to me most recently thinking about it all, how they've used that to confuse the issue and make Christianity simply, if it was said in the Old Testament, well, you can put it in the mouth of Jesus in Christianity, right? If God told them to go in and kill everybody then, well, God doesn't change because that does come out of the mouth of Jesus. Oh, God doesn't change. Yeah, but Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So the only thing we know about the Father is what we've seen in Jesus. So whatever we know about the Old Testament, that might be a bunch of dirty kings of Judah. And like Napoleon said, you write the history the way you want. Jesus accuses them, kill of the prophets. So you think we got all the accurate word, huh? I don't know. That's a strange coincidence, the way the Old Testament has them killing and raping, killing innocents, women and children. And, but you can take the virgins home and rape them. So, huh. And then Jesus comes along, and the people, he, you know, he don't ever have a nice thing to say to the Pharisees. I mean, he literally cuts them to the bone every time you see a word recorded of what Jesus said to a Pharisee. Cuts them to the bone. Not even Paul has the temerity to say some of the things, although Paul says enough to get his butt kicked, you know, stoned. And thrown out of every town, you know, where there's a synagogue. But uh, the things Jesus say, they want to kill him, is, is what's recorded. Modern Christianity, of course, hand in hand with government. They have big government functions. They have all the certain people that, you know, set, that help promote the separation of church and state. Why should we let a little thing like, you know, what Jesus taught interfere with, you know, having the greatest... Uh, terrorism state behind the scenes you know that that unseen dark force government and all that sort of thing parading around as if it's somehow justifiable and even respectable you know more people now i mean everybody i think that's all part of the modern plan of destruction that it's shown to be you know not respectable just the way christianity is has you know come out in the last hundred years or more as they, especially in, as it keeps unraveling now, as they keep showing what a priest, the Catholic priest, raping the little children, which of course that's never, that's always gone on, but never was a problem before. Now it's a problem, right? Gay marriage, never a problem before. Now it's a big problem. What's not a problem? Well, we're still genocidally killing people all over the world. We're, we're still pulling false flags and blaming people like we've done in Vietnam, like we've done in to Russia, like we've done with, uh, you know, everywhere, all over the world, Korea, all this stuff. That's okay. None of that's got to be stopped. None of that's the reason it's the end time. None of that's, God's not furious at any of that. The fact that we keep electing liars and crooks, even though our own constitution written by people that weren't Christian, but at least they had some moral backbone and an idea of how to structure a a government in which the power could be kept in some check as long as the people and remember these people were the rich white you know rich white landowning men if you were a white landowning man you had a vote and it was your responsibility to have a gun and to use that gun and that vote to make sure those people in your district in your government you know voted what you said and didn't take a bribe and go with the you know, GE or Raytheon, or the, you know, the government, uh, well, it wasn't government, it was these private interests, banks and such, right? That's, that's what they outlined. If you don't do that, you, of course, you can't keep a hold of a, can't keep your government true if the people don't vigilantly protect it. So, of course, you know, they, they laid out in their own explanation of what to do and how to do it. And we haven't done that. And no one wants to take the responsibility of that, just like no Christian wants to take the responsibility that Jesus laid it out, how to follow him, turn the other cheek, get on your knees, wash the feet of your servant, uh, don't hold things against the people that you know take from you or talk against you. In fact, bless the people that curse you, give to those that take from you, love those who hate you, even die for a friend. Give your life for a friend. Store up your riches in heaven. So, you know, that's what 
Christianity is, and I think it's embodied in that Philadelphian church, finally, as that, you know, if we're going to say final expression through this, whatever this biblical, you know, time is, this whole Mosaic covenant that ends in the, you know, the day of the Lord, not that great and dreadful day that's, you know, the white throne judgment when everybody gets raised and all our works are exposed for what they are, but the day that Jesus returns to settle this whole thing that started with Moses and the giving of the law and the the fact that now sin was known to man. We were responsible to God for sin. And since the darkness could not understand what light was, you can't understand, see, we can't understand unselfishness. You know, that's the trick in it all that comes to the garden and being born into humanity that's like a dualistic soul melted with this dust, right? Just like all the animals were made from the dust, so in essence, it's quite easy to say we're just like all the animals. They were all made by God from the dust, including the serpent. So we're like the animals in that way, but God breathed his life into us. So now comes this, oh, so we're responsible to follow that, that thing. Or if we do, if we respond to that, it leads to life, a life that never ends. And Jesus came to vindicate and show what is that life? What's that look like? The law came to demonstrate, as Paul said, how far we are from it. The law doesn't show what that life looks like. It shows what, why it brings death. Because look what the law is and look what we are. Huh, look how far from the law. And Jesus comes along for anyone who thinks they might be, you know, technically on schedule. It says if you even think it. Oh boy, there you go. I was doing good there for a while, but now, shucks. Now where are you going to get away with it? Either he's the judge or he's not the judge. If he's not the judge, yeah, kill him and say, yeah, screw you. Yeah, that's what they've been doing to the prophets all along, according to the scripture. What do you mean we're not right with God? <laughs> of course we are. Look at our power. Look at our authority. Look at our wealth. So I say that whole mentality is one that just reflects the natural relationship of mankind to God's spirit. It's summed up in this book of Revelation by the, you know, what God says to the churches, which are these believers now through all time from, you know, and it's the characteristics of belief from when you first hear it and it comes to you. See, this isn't the characteristics of the people that don't believe it, the seeds that don't take root. That's why this is here what the spirit says to the churches, not to the world. To the world, he says, you're going to be, everyone will be judged by your word. Don't even think death is you. You might live the life of the, you know, the Bill Gates or higher than that. The Rockefeller or higher than that. You know, those Italian nobility in the castles that are untouchable. The Rothschilds and higher than that, right? All the way to the grave, buried in a solid gold coffin with a big smile on your face. And Paul, Jesus, everyone seems to assure you <laughs> that will not, you will not escape that final judgment for your works. So, you know, that's what's really at stake in it all. The big thing about Christianity is this promise to follow him and that God would call out some to hear it. And he'd justify them. Not because they were going to be like the rest of the world. They were going to go out like, probably St. Francis or I, you know, I don't know about these people, but like the disciples, they were going to be part of that crew that really followed it. The, the ones like Ephesus that he says, you know, hold on to that first love. You know, many like St. Francis appear, apparently do. And then like Smyrna, I know you don't have any money. I know they're persecuting you, but you're rich. Hang on to that. Don't give that up. That could be the same person as they move through the stages of it, right? And then finally, where do you come out? What did Paul say? If, that, if you have not love, you don't gain anything. So where you come out at the other end is Church of Philadelphia. I mean, hopefully. Ready to give to your brother whatever they need. That's the Spirit of God. That's what you've learned either from Jesus or from, from just living that Spirit of God unto, you know, searching for that Spirit. That you never that you you know you never met through Jesus if you never encountered it that way. But the ones that believe in Jesus that find that it said that doors being held open for them. 
part of the first resurrection, not judged for your works. See, that's the promise to Christians. It's not a matter of threatening everyone else. It's saying, have, you know, do you realize what the, what the Messiah offered? <laughs> Everyone's going to be raised and judged for your works. Of course, if you're a good person, it's the best we can, any of us can do. See, Christians go around and say, no, but if you don't know Jesus, you go to hell. No, that's not true. That just turns people off from Christianity. That keeps people from studying Christianity. It separates that line into the people like the radical Islam that will be the radical for it instead of, instead of true, in spirit, study it in spirit and in truth. Test everything, like Paul said, right? So I say that's what's really going on is Christianity in the 21st century is purposely set up to fail. It's purposely set up to see these things that it says. This Lucifer kingdom is coming. Jesus is coming. He's sending everybody to hell that follows Lucifer and the world and transhumanism. You know, they're pushing all this stupidity because that's not what Scripture says. That's what they've been trained to say that, and, and to think, to truly believe it says. They're so shallow that if you try and argue with them, they are the people that will go grab all the things they've been taught, which is always the same dozen lines out of Scripture, and they will beat you to death with those 12 lines, no matter you argue for the rest of your life with every other line of Scripture. They'll beat you to death for those 12 lines that let them hang on to the fact that they're going to heaven, everyone else is going to hell, Jesus is coming soon. If you don't believe that, if you don't get on that blood, ho, 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 there's only one place for you, damnation. That's what it says. See, so Christianity in the 21st century has been sponsored to say that. That's really what all this wants to say to people. Whether you're a Christian or not, I hope more of the, I'm trying to reach the people that know that Christianity is false already. And you that are in Christianity that realize, like I did when I was in it, that something's not right. Something doesn't add up. You see all these lying, backstabbing, self-righteous, hypocritical Christians. And then you see the worst ones like my family that then claim to be getting a message from God. They're so self-righteous. They tell you what Jesus told them to tell you. Can you imagine that this is what Jesus is going to reward? And what do they tell you? right? You're not good enough. You're not like me. And what do they do? <laughs> they drive around in Mercedes Benz and keep all of their money to themselves. So yeah, if you think what it says in scripture is that people who just act like that and say, but Jesus, Jesus, I love Jesus. Jesus saves. If you think, you know, I don't know. You got to you just don't know scripture. You've been listening to Christianity talk about scripture. So anyway, that's what Bro Sal's all about these days anyway, is exposing false Christianity by simply presenting what, what the scripture says for people that might be interested, whether they be Christian or non-Christian. If you're not a Christian, the reason you should be interested is not going to save your soul. That's between you and God. And if you're being good in the sense everyone knows of good, if you don't hurt other people, and you've ever helped someone else at your own damn expense. I say you're, you've already, by scripture's account, you've proven to be on the right side. So, of course, the things we did yesterday don't count. If you go out and start hurting people tomorrow, well, that's, that's what matters. You, you keep that spirit of wanting to help somebody tomorrow, ready to put yourself out for someone else. I say you're on the right side of Jesus. I don't know what these Christians think. I don't care what, I don't care what the Christians say. You're on the right side of Jesus, actually. You don't know that because of the Christians, see? But the scripture says that. And it says more. It says that in the end, this Christianity is going to have an apostasia, forsaking of that love, right? The Laodicean church. They think they're rich and have need of nothing. And Jesus says... You don't even know you're poor and naked and wretched and miserable. So there's a reason the world of non-Christianity sees Christianity that, the way they do. And there's a reason Christianity resists any such correction or objection to its traditional interpretations. 
and how ingrained they are and why people that will continue to ingrain that or ingrain such obvious um, misdirections of that Christianity like the Joel Osteens, the modern, you know, people, they don't need to send anybody to hell. God loves everybody. Everything's good. Everybody's happy. You know, I'm not saying that at all. Of course, God loves everybody, but the Spirit of God is giving yourself, not to the church of Joel Osteen, who you see in this last hurricane didn't give, you know, kept his building closed during one of the worst disasters in American history. I mean, he should be run out of town, in my opinion. You don't have to hurt him or anything else, but I think that's it. Hey, that's it. You're revoked. You're not going to preach to us about prosperity and the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God, if it's not in giving your home to people who are starving and dying of a flood, well, then what God are you talking about, friend? So, you know, that's the only thing is separating real Christianity, which is so simple. <laughs> Turn your other cheek, give to others, not because you're too weak to take what you want, because you see the Spirit of God is not in strongest survive. The Spirit of God is not in eye for an eye. The Spirit of God is not in uh, some progression or evolution of intelligence and worthiness on, a, on an evolutionary or genetic level called eugenics, right? The worthiness is in our heart as we confront that relationship with God's Spirit as demonstrated in the Master who apparently according to the record you know got on his knees and washed the feet of his servant healed everyone without using that power to save himself or even advance himself in the way that the earth you know that we see as advancement and yet the whole time said this is eternal life i don't do anything but what the father does so in other words i'm not doing something that's my own idea he said that right but i'm not doing this because i you know this is what i think is right I do only what the Father does. I mean, you think about that. The representation of God came as a, a man that even the most righteous, Philip, when Philip was brought to Jesus, said, now here is an Israelite in which there's no fault. Right? Here's, here's a guy following the law. You want to see somebody who takes the law seriously? Hello, Philip. Here he is. Right? That's the way Jesus approached Philip. And when they told Philip, we found this guy, you know, from Nazareth, does anything good come from Nazareth? That was Philip's response. So think of what Jesus shows up looking like. He's from a place that any good Israelite thinks, Ugh, what kind of people come from there? So the whole story mirrors, I think, reality so beautifully that you can only expect that when this end comes, the Jesus that is the true Jesus will not be the expected one by the church, rapturing them to heaven and taking it out on the non-believers. That's not the Jesus that's going to show up. I mean, if one shows up, I don't believe there's a rapture, guys. I don't think the, there's any case for that in Scripture. There's a case for, for misinterpreting and pretending and promoting and propagandizing it to make Christianity look bad if what you want to do is make them look bad and disillusion them and divide them and destroy them. But but the real case is that uh, it, when Jesus does come, because he is prophesied to come, you, I'll go the way, I'll come again the way you've seen me go. And so when he does come again, you can bet, I, I'm betting, he's going to be just as big and, you know, a, a mystery in the sense, as he said, it, there, it would fool the very elect what's coming if that were possible. So it's going to be, again, a small group that says, no, no, that's Jesus. No, 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 look, the poor, miserable one. He's coming in glory, but mm, he's coming in glory as a king. But I still say that the man himself will not be recognizable to Christians because they think he upholds their idea of believing in Jesus and then go condemn everybody around you. And that's the very thing that you know, he said, go out and wash the feet of your servant to show who I am. Turn your other cheek. Give everything you have. That's what shows who I am. He sent his disciples out while he was alive with no, you know, barefoot. Don't take a purse, he told them, right? One tunic, right? Don't bring comfort. You're not going out there to be some big shot, hot shot. I'm a Jesus preacher. I'm, you know, I'm coming 
You know that guy, Jesus? Look how we come out into the world. We look good. We have lots of money. Look at that. I got a whole train of people behind me carrying my tunics. I got a different tunic for every, for every show. No, because otherwise, wouldn't, I mean, if that, if that wasn't the case, couldn't somebody say, well, Jesus is the greatest. I should put on the greatest show, shouldn't I? Get me a dozen tunics. I'll, I'll change it every 20 minutes during the show. You know what I mean? So, no, if you go out there, no person with one tunic. Nobody can deny your, your sincerity in that light, can they? Paul goes on later to tell the church, hey, you just, how can anyone say something bad about you if you're following Jesus? If you're just giving anything you have, loving anyone that comes your way, ready to give, you know, just feeling like what love is, is ready to serve, ready to give. Love your brother the way Jesus loved you. You didn't deserve it, but he loved you. He healed you. So, you know, that's what is anticipated. So you have to imagine that that's what, when Jesus returns, and that's what he'll be rewarding wherever he finds it. You know, and I think that's why it's such many will come in that day. You know, Lord, hey, here I am. Wait a minute, me, Jesus, here I am. Like my uncle. Hell, I was casting out demons in your name. I was prophesying in your name. And I imagine he'll look my uncle square in the eye and say, Get away from me, evildoer. I never knew you. Right? As you say, I don't think those people are going to hell. I just think it's a big wake-up call, isn't it? Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Not you. Get away from me. I never knew you. You over here. Huh, me? When did I ever, you know, when did I ever do anything worthy of your love? Hey, Remember that time you helped out over here? Come on in, you righteous. So see, it's a whole different measure. So I say, saying Jesus, Jesus puts you in a much more dangerous camp than not knowing him at all and just simply knowing that you should love your neighbor. Because when you say Jesus, Jesus, you might wind up one of these Laodiceans who thinks they're rich and has need of nothing. Or worse, like my uncle prophesying who goes to heaven and who goes to hell because God told you. You think you can tell others. Anyway, so Christianity in the 21st century is a setup. It's set up to fail. It's set up to be destroyed. And the key thing is, is that they're wrong about everything. <laughs> Jesus isn't coming now. The end is not yet. It's Jesus is nobody's God's not destroying America. Well, Jonathan Kahn was wrong about his Shemitah year. He's not destroying America because of the banks. Because they don't operate out of America anyway. America is the military arm to dupe all the Christians into battle. The banks are run out of London, England. And he's not coming right now. So the, the Antichrist isn't, isn't the Catholic Church. They're certainly part of this end time scheme. But they're not the one that's got to stand up in the temple and say, I am God. How could the Pope do that? Nobody wants a person that stands for Jesus to run the future. The Pope's part of the setup to destroy Christianity. It's funny how I'm, you know, maybe the most convincing thing about the evidence of, of this channel to me is that I'm the only guy that seems to see the clarity of all that and how it fits with Albert Pike strategy in any way you slice it, how it fits with the way the world's been set up, how it fits with the just odd sort of reality that just like America's come to be a country who thinks it you know, the Constitution, as if our government today reflects anything of the Constitution, which said the federal government should be very small and only exist so that the states could be free and the citizen could be free. <laughs> you know, we got more federal laws that restrict citizens' movement than practically anywhere in the world. I mean, it's like China has probably got, you know, more personal freedom or similar, right? It's all the same. Uh, and so they pretend that's, you know, the Constitution theoretically was set up to ensure personal freedom under a state system in which representative government could make sure all the people were having the sort of government they, that was best for their state and a federal government that simply existed to make sure yeah, the states will come together and you can't push anybody around. That's it. Nobody gets to be told you've got to do this and you've got to do that. This is the whole point of the American 
Constitution. So to pretend we're anything like that today is just simply to be brainwashed. And so if you look at Christianity that way, it's just total brainwash. Everything about it is wrong. So when you look at it, you know, in the context of it being set up to fail, it makes sense why everything's wrong. It makes sense why Islam was funded from, you know, almost 100 years ago, the Wahhabi regime of the Kingdom of Saud and and this this radical Islam and the division of the, you know, why don't the Sunni and Shia have more in common with each other and with the Christians and to fight the Zionist movement, which everyone knows got nothing to do with the real Jews at all. These people aren't Jews. They don't act like Jews. They don't do what is Jewish. They just claim the Jewish religion and take the land <laughs> the, the God said he gave them a long, long time ago. And then God said he took from them. And then God said, I will bring a remnant back. And so they said, ah, that's us. And, you know, I've done extensive uh, research and some writing and a lot of teaching to demonstrate that's not true. And, of course, that gets completely ignored. Can't get anybody to pay any attention to how obvious it is that, you know, that's a claim that needs to be just because they say, hey, yeah, God said it was going to happen. Here we are. Well, wait a minute. Is just because is that the happening? Or are they taking advantage of the fact that God said it was going to happen? Did God point to any other circumstances under which it was going to happen? Oh, yeah, they would be, you know, almost decimated. God himself would bring them back to the land and be their king, set a king over them. They would be a humble people. Never again would they be the reproach of any nation. And they would be a blessing to all nations for, from that time forth. So if you want to say that any of that qualifies... You know, hey, hey, we got some questions there then. How come that hasn't panned out? Was God just wrong? He brought them back, but it hasn't quite worked out yet. Anyway, that's all the stuff we study. But in this, I want to point out the fact that all of that makes sense in a context of a false Christianity, a false Judaism, and a false Islam in the sense, not that the people, the, the masses of people are false. They're following what they're taught, what they've been taught has been influenced for a hundred years to be false so that it might bring them all to war why because the people that want all that and have been funding it they believe their god and they don't want a god to worship they don't want anybody that insists there's a god to worship that's why they give them lucifer and everybody can rally around lucifer but when you get into the teachings of that the lower exoteric symbols in which lucifer's flying around like an angel and satan is something that's real give way to the higher initiated understanding like in the kabbalah that it's all an allegory and that we are gods we are divine and so the people that run the world aren't looking to crown lucifer but they're happy to give another god into the mix for people to argue about and to divide someone against these christians who they've made so so obscene they've made such an obscene profanity out of christianity in the world and islam but especially at least islam has the somewhat remarkably you know admirable character of being of of appearing uh, devout right those those people at least seem to believe in their god and try to follow their god though they're led into a very strict idealism and militaristic sort of literalism but it's because they believe it. They were a people that really believe. And so their level of brainwashing and what can be done with them appears to be at a different state than what can be done with, you know, a Christians. And then the Jews, of course, they were wiped out as much as possible, I imagine, during the Holocaust so that they could bring these, you know, European bankers could fund their Jewish movement and, and claim the... Uh, God bringing the Jews back to to Israel. But all of that, of course, has done nothing but conflict, where the scripture said when God does it, they'll be humble, no one will have a reproachable thing to say, and there'll be a blessing to all nations. But what Albert Pike says, or may have said, is that we'll pit Islam against Zionism. And then the world, once more unable to, you know, know what what to do about this. What to do about what? This, This great schism, this state of Zionism put right in the middle of the Arab territory, militaristic, oppressive, terroristic state, now affecting the whole world. So again, was it 
just pikes, you know, was that real or not? Look at our modern world and I say it looks certainly real to me and the pieces look a lot more rational if you put them in the place of being set up, Christianity, Islam, and the modern Jewish state to fail. They're not waiting for a Messiah. The Jews are, just like the real Christians are waiting for Jesus, just like the real Muslims are waiting for their, they're waiting for Jesus and to come and support their Mahdi. That's the way their story reads. And so they're waiting for a supernatural happening, which is why the people putting on the show, they have to make that happen. Which is why this prophecy, I think of an antichrist, the not deliverer. It's not like a real devil that that's the, that's their story to fool everyone. And they got to bring miracles to, to make that story good. But it's not Satan coming from heaven. It's them bringing their Messiah at the time when they're ready now to claim God has come. Here's the Messiah. Here he is. Why? See, this is what I've always thought. Why would they? How are you going to fake that? <laughs> because it brings war. That's why. Because when that Messiah is not Christ, but he satisfies all the New Agers, he's the Maitreya's answer. He's the atheist answer. Oh, well, this guy's okay. He's not claiming everybody's going to hell, right? He satisfies everybody except those who are really waiting for Jesus. And that's why the danger, I say the apostasy is, it's all the Western Santa Claus Christianity is going to buy this story, I think, and support Israel. Or that's where that great division is going to come. Because remember, guys, real Orthodox Christianity was the Middle East. <laughs> when they got persecuted, they ran to Africa, they ran to, uh, into Russia. And they got, keep getting persecuted, keep getting, they keep running deeper into Russia. That's why, you know, you think Mongolia and all these places are full of sort of, I don't know, some, I always grew up thinking there's some backwards, atheist, communist, devil worshipers. No, they're Orthodox Christians. That's why we've grown up with the idea that they're atheists. <laughs> because they made the country officially atheist like they made the Chinese officially atheist. Of course, the Chinese people have always been deeply spiritual. Just like the Russian people were always Orthodox Christians. And that's why they have to be set up as the red team against the blue team. Because you, you just can't starve them all. They starved what? I don't know. The, what did they say? 30 million, 40 million? I think the total that they've killed now in all these wars and starvations and from the First World War and everything is something like 50 or 60 million in our population boom that we're having, our overpopulation. They've killed 50 or 60 million in the last hundred years. And it's just, you know, when you look at that, it's Christians, Orthodox Jews. Orthodox Christians and now's coming the cleansing and they've been building up Islam to be a terror for the end. They took that territory and gave it to these Islamic people who they've been controlling since they took over Islam through the Catholic Church. But that's all getting uh, uh, into too long a discussion. So let's just cut it here and say that Christianity in the 21st century is the false Christianity. It was created to be for the 21st century. And because of that, they're one of the most dense. I mean, there is, it's in, is inarguable as a patriot of America trying to argue that, you know, America is not great and free. They're terrorists. They've been nothing but false flag terrorism for, I mean, you know, after genocide. They're genocidal maniacs and terrorists. That's the history of America. Not great and free. They gave the public a certain amount of relative freedom in the world to dupe the public and to supporting a militarized state that could go take control for the banks through the banking but could enforce it because otherwise people have tried to kick them out in indonesia they tried to kick them out he got dead in south america they tried to kick him out he got dead right in iran he tried to kick him out he got dead in egypt he tried to kick him out he got dead so it's the military that backs up the banking structure which allows them to set up their red team blue team world in which the people can be led to follow their team and the propaganda can be given sufficient so if you live in the Koreas you know what team everybody's on you push one button the whole crowd goes in one direction 
But in America, well, in Europe, ooh, Australia, e Europe, you know, you got to divide these people. Canada, you got to divide these people. They don't all go in one direction. So, okay, 100 directions, 50 blue and 50 red. That way, whatever direction they go, there's someone to oppose them for them to hate and fight. Never look to the people who are dividing them. So Christianity in the 21st century is absolute. Um, well, it's so many things. It's a misunderstanding because it's, it's been made to be. Just like Hollywood isn't a dream maker. It's an illusion maker. Right? It doesn't make dreams. Yeah, it makes dreams in the sense it pulls the wool over your eyes. Puts you in a dream state so you don't see what's going on. All right. I'll talk to you guys soon. Thanks for being here.